in the middle of our second week of a series that I started last week, and I just, I, I'm really, um, I'm really feeling this, ser- this series so much because uh, we live in a world and a culture that has forgotten some very virtuous things uh, that have been historically good for America, historically good for where we are as a country. Uh, but unfortunately, we've drifted. We've drifted away from, uh, from, from some virtuous attitudes that we need to have in our lives. These are biblical virtues, virtues that uh, God encouraged us to have first and foremost. Our fathers that founded the country encouraged us to have them, and we had them for many generations. But unfortunately, there has been a decline of having virtuous actions and virtuous attitudes about things. What does that mean? Uh, Well, last week we started off talking about um, this thing called honor, the forgotten virtue of honor. Um, And if you guys missed last week, I think you missed a, a powerful message for where we're at as a culture. Our culture, unfortunately, does not honor practically anybody. There is a lot of dishonor going on. Uh, I'm not talking about respect. You guys remember last week I distinguished respect is for, respect is earned. People do things and we respect them for what they do. But honor is different. Honor is, is a voluntary giving. We honor someone because of the office or the position they hold. So respect, you may respect somebody and respect the decisions they make because they're a good person and they do good things and they have a a, a good life and you respect that as well. But there are people maybe in your life that you don't respect, but you must honor because the scripture said that you must honor those in authority over you. Your boss, everybody think about your boss. You got to honor your boss. Uh, You need to honor your mother and your father. You may not respect... You may not respect everything they say and do, but scripturally it says, honor your father and mother and you'll have long years of your life. Me growing up, that was because if I honored my father and mother, I wouldn't be beat to death. That was pretty much what that that meant. I could have a long life not getting beat to death. Um, But you guys know what I'm talking about. We honor people in authority. We honor our, our leaders, our political leaders. You may disagree with them. You may not respect them, but you honor the offices in which they hold. If all of us, would just honor people in a better way, it could be a very good world we live in if honor was given. But see, honor is not. Dishonor is given. So last week, I encouraged us as a Crossview community to start honoring uh, people. And and, uh, and I had several people uh, tell me that they really appreciated the message, but they also didn't like the message. So I don't know what that meant. Appreciate but didn't like, but that's okay. That's, that's sometimes what I get as a, as a pastor. They, they appreciate it. And, uh, and, I, and I even went to a basketball game this past week, and um, I sat there. And as we went on, I, I, one of the parents said, one of the parents said, honor that coach, honor the coach, honor the coach, honor the coach. So it was a mantra that she, you know, yeah. So, you know, uh, it's always about honoring the people in our lives. And so that was last week. Um, next week, I want to talk about this forgotten virtue in a world full of disposable relationships, in a world full of social media that if you don't like what somebody says about you, you don't like what they, what they put on there, if they don't say it exactly the way you do, what do you do? You block them. We just cut them off. We're like, done. I'm done with you. We're not going to do this anymore. In a world full of disloyalty, I'm going to talk about the forgotten virtue of loyalty, that we're loyal to the people in our, that are closest to us in our life. We're loyal to them. Okay, so we're going to talk about that next week. And then we're going to talk about in a world full of anything goes, in a world full of uh, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, uh, what happens behind closed doors, got, no one ever find out. We're going to talk about integrity, the forgotten virtue of integrity. And then our last week, we're going to talk about in a world full of entitlement where it says, gimme, gimme, gimme. It's mine, it's mine, it's mine. I deserve, I deserve, I deserve. It's all mine. We're going to talk about the forgotten virtue of gratitude. Okay, so that's where we're going on this series. And we're having the teens stay with us in this series because these are virtues that they have forgotten about. So teenagers, sit up straight in your chairs. Keep going, keep going. There you go. Appreciate that. Thank you for honoring me in that. Uh, We are, we're going to talk about uh, a subject matter today that is probably um, one of the most challenging ones that I'll be speaking about in this series because uh, honor, we think of honor, we go, yeah, that's good. And we, integrity, yeah, we got to have integrity and we got to have loyalty and we need to have a heart of gratitude. We can understand and appreciate all these. But today, probably the reason why this one is so hard is because it's the most countercultural message I'm going to preach. 
It goes against everything the world is telling us today. It, it is polar opposite of what the world would tell you is right and proper. Today, I want to talk with you about the forgotten virtue of purity. Turn to your neighbor and say purity. So to, to get us started today, I want to kind of uh, help with this question. How many of you guys in this place have ever been stolen from? You've ever had maybe a house broke into or a car broke into? You've had something stolen from you in your past. Raise your hands if you've ever had any, been robbed, been, maybe been held up at gunpoint, maybe that there. Or, you know, you keep your hand up. If you've ever been robbed, just keep your hands up. Just kind of hold, hold them up high. Look around here. Look at this. Look at this. This is amazing. Yeah, I mean, in the first service, same way. The majority of the people had said, yeah, I've been, been robbed or victimized in some way. I remember... Uh, whenever Michelle and I were, were early married, we were probably two or three years married, and we were, in, uh, we were in Bible college. Now, we weren't at the Bible college. We were at our apartment. And um, I remember waking up one morning, jumping in my old ruggedy truck and heading to class. And I had next to me, I had in my truck, you guys, and, and some of you want to remember this. You young guys want to remember this. But those of you my age uh, and older and, and in between, you remember this. I had... Um, uh, uh, you know, my CDs, of course, in the, in the zip case, you know, the case logic zip case. You guys remember those black cases that you had? And then you had a portable CD player that, that sat on top of it. It was one kit that you could put a handle on and take with you, you know? I'll never forget. I loved it, man. I rocked out to Striper and Petra and all that in that car groups and bands you've never heard of. Uh, but uh, we had, I, had, I had this in my truck. And I remember I got and went to class that day. I noticed it wasn't there. I didn't have my tunes to get me to school, and I, and I, didn't, have a, I didn't have a way to, to rock out, so I just sang really high, yeah, Jesus. So I sang like that all the way there and had my music going. And uh, i never forget, I thought, well, maybe I took it in last night. I don't remember where it was. And then I got home from class that day, and I walked in. I was like looking all around. I was looking high and low. And then I started, I went back out to my truck, and I realized more and more stuff was missing. More and more stuff was gone. The glove box, I mean, practically everything was gone out of there. I was just, and I was like, oh my gosh, I just, I got broken into it. I was robbed, you know? I, got, I, got, I had a thief in here. And I remember following that particular instance, how aware I was when I would sleep at night, I was cognitive of what was going on around me. Like any noise that went on, I would jump up out of bed, I'd look out the window, I would, I would see what was happening. I was very aware. I was heightened to the violation that took place inside of me. I was heightened now to the experience. I felt violated. I felt like someone had approached and encroached on my space. I don't know if that's how you felt. That's how I felt. I felt very much violated. And it's, it's kind of like a bear and her cubs. You know, if you come upon a, a bear that just had little baby cubs, and if you get anywhere close to those cubs, you're going to be mauled and put to death because that mama bear is going to protect her little cubs. Much, much like many of you mothers here today and your fathers, you do anything to protect your kids. When we're put, training our kids about riding bikes or, or, or skateboarding or whatever, um, the day and time that I grew up on is way different than the day and time in which we grew up on. I mean, the adventure of riding a bike when I was a kid was how many, how many, how, how many broke bones can you get on a, on a bike ride? That was kind of the adventure of it all. You know, how many bones can you break on this ride? That was really it, you know. Uh, today is not that way. You know, and, and it's rightly so, but, you know, we, we really protect our kids. I mean, we put a helmet on them. You know, we put elbow pads and knee pads, bubble wrap them from head to toe to go out and ride a bike, you know, bubble wrap them to, to ride a skateboard, you know? I mean, we're so worried about what's going to happen to them. We, we protect every part of them. We don't want to get a boo-boo. We don't want them to get a scratch on them. We don't want to hurt them. And rightly so, my question today is this. In our efforts to protect them so much physically, parents, I wonder how many times we don't necessarily protect their hearts. We protect them on the outside, but there's so much that's going on that their hearts are not being truly protected. I believe God calls us as people to be protecting our kids physically and protecting their hearts and their minds internally, the emotional, spiritual side of them. See, what happened was whenever I was broke into, whenever I was violated by a, a thief that came and took my stuff, what they did is they encroached my property and they took what was not theirs. And I remember going through emotions of angriness. I remember being upset about it. 
Not because I lost stuff, but because I felt violated by what was happened. But yet, parents, every single one of us, there is a real enemy of our soul. And his job, his task, is to steal, to kill, and destroy our kids. Hello? His job is to encroach our property, encroach our kids, and to steal away the beauty of the purity that God has given them. And when we do not, when, if we're not careful, we'll find ourselves, much like my truck, we'll come out one day and all of a sudden our kids have lost the purity of their life because we didn't protect their hearts like we should have. So today I want to talk about the purity, the forgotten virtue of purity. Not an easy message, but one that we all need to hear. Every single one of us from young and old alike, we will get something out of today's message. Stand to your feet with me today as we read God's word and understand where we're going today. Hold your Bibles in your hands if you would, and let's read this. I hold the hope of the world, the blueprint for life. I will read it, study it, and share it. God, help me to understand it, apply it, and live it in Jesus' name. It says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, it says, Blessed are the pure in heart. Why? For they will what? Blessed are the who? Blessed are the pure. pure in heart. Why? For they will see God. God, help us today to hear from your word. Help us to survey our lives and help us to discover the power of who you are. May we surrender ourselves to you and open our hearts up to you and open our minds up to you. May you speak to us and may you encourage us and may you guide us. And may we see God who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. That word, blessed are the pure in heart, heart comes from the Greek word, of course, cardio, which is cardiac, which it actually means uh, the heart is everything that's life-giving in our lives comes from the heart. If our heart is sick, our body is sick. If our heart is not well, our lives are not well, because everything in our lives comes from the heart. The heart is the most powerful organ you have. You have no heart, you have no life. The heart is crucial for life. And in our world today, it's very common for us to, to do a lot of things to protect kids and protect our, our, our families, but we oftentimes will use this statement about people that we don't know much about. We'll say this, well, they have a good heart. Well, they have a good heart. You know, we'll say that about um, some boy that's dating our daughter, doesn't go to church, doesn't have anything to do with God, and we will justify them dating by saying, well, they have a good heart. He has a good heart. I mean, he's unemployed. He lives in a van down by the river, <laughs> smokes pot for dinner, but he's got a good heart. Let him be. He's got a good heart. And what happens is so many times this common saying is really the dumbest saying we could ever say because it's not true. There's no such thing, there's no such person with a good heart. Don't believe me? Let's read about it. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9 through 18. This is what Jeremiah says. It says, the heart. What is it? The heart. What is it? The heart is what? It's deceitful above all things and beyond who can understand it. Then it says in verse 10, I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind. What is the heart? The heart is deceitful beyond cure. The heart wants what it wants, but the heart sometimes wants what it wants polar opposite of what God wants. So the Lord searches the heart and examines the mind. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18 through 19, Paul is talking to the church in Ephesus, and he is, he is encouraging them. He's saying, listen, guys, listen, there's going to be people in your midst that they are going to be deceptive, and they're going to try to lure you away. This church had many different uh, people that would come in that pretended to be Christians, that pretended to be Christ followers, but really they were there, and they were in a deceitful place. They were, they were trying to bring division into this community. So Paul writes this. This is what he says. He said about these people. He says, they are darkened. Talking about people. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to what? Say it with me. Due to the hardening of their hearts. So here's what Paul says. Listen. 
The reason why they're acting the way they're acting, the reason why they're doing what they're doing is because their heart has been hardened and they are ignorant to the things that they're doing. He's a good boy. He's got a good heart. She's a good girl. She has a good heart. I'll say it to you this way. If you've ever gone to a theater and uh, you go from the lobby to the actual theater room and you, you're walking from light and you're going into a dark place, uh, you, you, have to try to find your, your, you have to find your way and it's hard to adjust uh, your eyes. And so what do you do? You, you're like you know, stepping over people, trying to get to your spot, and you're, you're trying to hold on to the candy and the pop that you smuggled in underneath your coat um, or your purse, and you're trying to get there safely without losing anything, and, and you sit down, and when you finally sit down, you look around, and all of a sudden, your eyes start to adjust to the darkness. You couldn't see before, but now you can because you have been adjusted and acclimated to the darkness. And families, homes, parents, grandparents, could it be that we have been so inundated by the world that our eyes have adjusted to the impurities that we allow to come into our home every day, the things we allow to be watched, the things that we allow to come across our computer, the things that we uh, engage in and indulge in, could it be that we have just adjusted our eyes to the darkness, that we do not see the impurities that are right before us? And I would say... Yes. Ephesians says it this way, Ephesians 4.19, having lost all sensitivity, having given themselves over to the sensuality and indulged in every kind of impurity. In a world full of anything goes, in a world full of says, if it feels right, do it. We must have a line that says we must be, in, we must be pure. We must have a life of Purity. Because without Christ, there is no such thing as purity. We would never give a, a baby bottle to a baby full of poison. We would never do that. We would never um, fill a pool full of acid and tell our kids, go jump in it and have a good swim. We would never do anything like that, but yet, hmm, we send our 15-year-old daughter on a date with a pubescent hairy leg boy. He only has one thing in his mind, and you can say he has a good heart, but he only has one thing in his mind, and that is he wants a girl. We take and we give our kids, our 12, 12 to 15, 16-year-old 16 young boys, this thing called a cell phone without putting any kind of parameters of safety or, or, or precautions on it because it takes too much energy and I don't quite understand technology, so I'm just going to go ahead and give it to them. And we give these boys, testosterone-filled young men, the gateway to the most disgusting pornographic images that they're ever going to see, and their mind is distorted for the rest of their life that that's what a marriage is supposed to be. We're not guarding or protecting their hearts. Forgive me that I get emotional because we are setting them up for marital failure because they're distorted in their view of what real love is like. But I really don't know, understand technology, so I just, I'm just going to give it to them and they'll figure it out. They won't go there. They have a good heart. They will go there. I'm ratting out all the young boys in the house. They will go there. They will be tempted. There will be a time and place where they will find a secret place and they will look. And the enemy of their soul will rob them of their purity because we did not protect them as parents. That's a hard message, right? It's hard, isn't it? It doesn't change just the young men. It changes with the men. Men, we're just the same. What filters, what protocols do we have in life? How are we protecting ourselves? We take our hard-earned money, we take the money we work hard for, and we go and spend it on entertainment that would hurt the heart of God, all because we want to do what we want to do. So I want to challenge us today 
to stop being Christian families. Christian families means nothing. In fact, in the world today, 70% of Americans call themselves Christian families. They're good little families. They get up and they go to church and they, they do the right thing. They look the right part. But Christian family is, I don't even call myself a Christian. I don't want to be a Christian. I don't want to be a Christ follower. So I want to challenge us today to not just be a Christian family, not to be a Christian home, but to be a Christ-centered community inside your home where everything flows from Christ, for Christ. Everything is about Christ. Psalmist says it this way, Psalm 119, verse 9, says, how can a young person stay on the path of purity? I would say this, how can any of us stay on a path of purity? You don't have to be young. Gentlemen, we're in the same boat. Ladies, you're in the same boat. We're all in the same boat. All of us are being bombarded every day by impure things in the world. I'm not just talking about sexuality. I'm not just talking about sex. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about even beyond that. I'm talking about the things we watch, the things we put our minds to, the things we talk about, the conversations we have, the dirty jokes that we tell behind closed doors. All that falls into the category of impurity. All of it has an effect on our lives. So how can we stay pure? How can we stay pure? We stay pure by what? By living according to God's word. See, the heart is deceitful, wicked, cannot have a cure. What's the cure for the, for the heart? It's the word of God. It's living according to God's word. Some people say, just follow your heart. Oh, just just follow your heart. Wherever your heart leads, that's the right decision. Just follow your heart. Do you know how many girls have lost their virginity because they followed their heart? Oh, I know this is hard to hear. I love him. I love him. If I don't show him I love him, he's going to leave me for another. Tell that loser to get lost. Move on. Purity is priority to you. You know how many young men followed their heart? Can't follow our heart. Why? Because it's wicked. It's deceitful. It doesn't have a cure. But the Lord looks and he navigates the mind and the heart. I'll say it to you this way. How can our families find a path of purity? By living according to the word. We will seek you in all of our hearts. Do not let us stray from, our, from your commands. Because what we do today does matter. How can a young person stay pure? A young person can stay pure by coming out of the darkness, not letting their eyes adjust to the darkness, by not letting their hearts be hardened, and by finding Christ, the center of everything they do. So I want to give you three thoughts today, guys, three thoughts that I think are going to help us find a path to purity. These three thoughts are going to apply to all of us, from young to old alike. doesn't matter what age you are. All of us can do these three things. The first thing that I want to talk about is this. How do we find, how do we find the path to purity? First off is this. Get our own hearts right. Say that with me. Get our own hearts right. Turn to your neighbor and say, get our own hearts right. From 18 to 88, it does not matter what age you are. Get your own hearts right. Solomon said it this way. Above all else, guard your heart. For everything flows from it. So inside your home, inside your life, you ask this question. What am I looking at that's impure? What am I doing that's not right? How am I behaving that's causing effect in my life? How am I being influenced? How am I influencing others? Ask yourself, get your own heart right. Some say, let your conscience be your guide. Little Jiminy Cricket, you know, when we think of conscience, we think of little Jimmy Cricket, you know? I don't let your conscience be your guide. What a bunch of stupid advice. <laughs> so dumb. Let your conscience be your guide. Do you know some people don't have a conscience? It's why they do the wicked and evil things they do, and they justify it. This is not the best advice. Your conscience cannot be your guide. The only thing that can be your guide is the Spirit of God and His Word living in us. I remember I've had several times like this that uh, through, my, through my life that I would uh, go to a movie and uh, 
I, I wouldn't do a lot of research on the movie. I would just kind of go to it. Friends were going to it. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'll go to it. Happened just a, a several years ago. Um, typically, I always check this. If you guys don't know, this website called Plugged In. If you don't know this, write this down. It's called Plugged In. Just spell out plugged in in.com. Plugged In has got, I've said this time and time, about focus on the family. It has movies and TV shows, all the TV shows that are on right now. They review everything, movies, TV shows, music. Your kids are listening to, you don't want to listen to it, and you don't really know what the artist stands for or who they are. It has all this online, like literally, parents, be the investigator, be the detective for your kids, okay? Because your kids do not give a rip what, they, they like the beat. They like just, dun, 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 dun. that's it, man, that's it. You know, so you're responsible to be able to, to put some of these boundaries up. But I remember uh, there was a couple times that I would go out with friends and I didn't do plugged in. I didn't plug it in before I went. I thought, ah, you know, how, how bad can it be? It's, you know, yeah, it's radar, but it's a pretty rough movie. It's probably got lots of blood and lots of gore and everything like that. So I'm going to go. So we would go with friends. And I remember sitting in this one movie and like, you know, as soon as the opening credits were done, I mean, you talk about F-bombs. It was like F, F-bomb everywhere. Like, boom. I felt like it was blowing up everywhere. It was like, boom, boom, boom. Like, I mean, one minute in. And, and I, I sat there, and I was like, and I'm with, you know, there are people from church, and I'm kind of like, huh. I'm sweating. I'm wiping the sweat off. And I just like, I just like, like okay, kind of three. Just get up and leave. Just get up and leave. Like, three, two, three. No, you didn't do it. Now, like, get up now. Get up now. And, I, and, and like, it read me up. And then finally, I just, I just stood up, and I walked out. You know, I just left. I never, I didn't come back. Just left them in there. <laughs> Let them worry about it. And uh, they never went out with me again, but it was a lot of fun, you know, whenever, <laughs> it felt great, it felt wonderful. Um, but I didn't do it because I wanted them to feel conviction. I was feeling conviction. Your convictions are your convictions, okay? I'm not, I don't, I don't want to, I'm not casting judgment to them or anybody. What I'm saying is, for me, I knew that that was something that I did not want. Was it just a word? Yeah, it's just a word, but it's not the word. It's the essence in which it's delivered. It's the community. It's everything that comes into it. It's why we have to challenge our kids and what they watch and what they do. We have to encourage them. Does, is this conversation, does this conversation bring hurtful, does it hurt the heart of God? Does this an interaction hurt God? Ask God to help you, guide you, direct you, show me, convict me. The relationships and friendships that I have, are they hurting the heart of God? And how do we find clarity? God, help me to get my heart right first. That's our first step. Get our heart right first, okay? Second thing is this. When we parent, parents, we're going to parent to the heart. Everybody say that with me. Parent to the heart. Some of you, this, I believe, is going to be like, like, oh yeah, that's what I need to be doing. Because what we often do is we parent to actions, okay? What I mean by that is we parent by, by making our kids do what we tell them to do. And they will do it, like most of the time, like good little soldiers will. Um, so, you know, Tommy smacks Sally. Sally, ah, you hit me, mommy. Sally's crying all the time anyway, you know. And you go to, you go to Timmy, Tommy, I don't know, one of those kids, uh, and you say, you say, Timmy, apologize to your sister right now. I'm sorry. And you go, I'm a pretty good parent. I got them to apologize. Or you, you're, you're, they want to go to a party, and they want to go hang out with their friends, and you're like, Nope, I, I know those friends. I know what they do. You're not going. You're not going. And they're like, fine. And they go, bam, slam the door. And you go, hmm, I showed them. I'm a good parent. This parenting to the heart is way different than just parenting for actions. See, because when we parent for actions, what we're doing is we're actually teaching our kids to be good little actors in the play we're putting them in. Action, you go. Action, act that way. Behave that way. But deep down, kids are rebellious. So we must 
parent to the heart. Saul, Sam, 1 Samuel 16 says this way. The Lord does not look on things like people do. People look on the outward appearance, but the God, but the Lord looks at the heart. So what we have to do, parents, is we have to take a little bit of time. Instead of expecting for immediate correction, we need to help them navigate their hearts and their intention by asking questions. Timmy, why did you hit your sister? Do you think that that was the proper response that you needed to have in this time? Timmy, how would you feel if your sister hit you that way? And if she did, we would be talking with her the same way. Timmy, does God want us to react that way? No, he doesn't. Timmy, here's a big one, people, parents. Timmy, can we pray and ask God to help you handle that situation different in the future? slowly navigating and parenting to the heart. You see, there was this group of people in the, in the New Testament with Jesus known as Pharisees, religious people, that on the outside, they looked perfect. On the outside, they did everything right. On the outside, they acted the right way, played the right way. They, went, they, they, they got dressed up for church, and they said, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, and everything was good, and life was good. And Jesus looked at them one day and said, you guys are nothing but a broad of vipers. Because on the outside, you look like you got it down, but deep down inside, you're rebellious. You're wicked. It's where we get the word hypocrite from. Hypocrite comes from the Greek word hypocrite, which actually means player, uh, actors in a play. Do you realize that when we teach our kids and we parent to their actions, we're actually teaching them to be hypocrites? But when we parent to the heart, we're teaching them to submit and surrender to the will of God. Submit and ask God to help you the next time. Kids... Outwardly agreeable, but inwardly rebellious. Right actions come from right hearts. Is it any wonder that so many of our teenagers, when they graduate and they go off to college, they party it up? Because for the first time, their parents aren't there to see their actions. And they can do whatever they want to do. We're going to parent to the... We're going to parent to the heart. We're going to get our own hearts right. And then number three is this. We're going to pursue perfect purity of the heart. Say with me, pursue. 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 Understand I didn't say accomplish. We're going to pursue because there is no such thing as accomplishing perfect purity. But with God, we're going to pursue God and we're going to seek God and we're going to ask him for perfect purity. Ephesians 5, chapter 3 says it this way, but among you, there not be, may not be even a hint of sexual morality of any kind of impurity or of greed or of any improper, because these are improper for God's people. Not even a hint of sexual morality. Isn't any wonder why our teenagers are so broken, so longing for someone to love them, that so many times a, a girl or a boy will go out on a date and sleep with 75% of the people they date looking for love. Is it any wonder why our homes can feel so dysfunctional? Because before the marriage, maybe mom chose to live with two or three guys and dad chose to live with two or three women and that relationship didn't work out so they just broke up and walked away. Then when they finally do get married, the commitment just isn't the same because it's just another breakup that's going to happen. Is any wonder why we're so convoluted our kids have such a distorted view of sex because the world has contaminated it and polluted it from the beautiful thing that God created. It must not be even a hint. I tell the story so many times. People, I said this story, I said this illustration many times, but it just applies just beautifully. A little bit won't hurt you. Just a little bit. There was a story of a boy that wanted to go out with his friends, and he uh, wanted to go see a PG-13 movie. He was, you know, he was 13 years old. He could definitely go see that. And he goes to his mom and says, Mom, I want to go see this movie with my friends. 
PG-13. And she said, well, what's it PG-13 about? She goes, he goes, well, you know, it's got, you know, I think it's, probably, it's got some language probably. You know, it might have some sexual in the windows or something, might talk about sex or something. Now, I think it has some alcohol scenes in it or something. I mean, it has just a little bit, little bit of stuff in it. Not much, Mom. It's, 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 it's pretty good. I mean, it's all right. It's okay, Mom. I, I think it's fine for me to go. Mom said, well, before you go, let me make you a snack. I want to make you some brownies before you go to your movie. And he's like, this is great, Mom. Yeah, I'll, I'll take some brownies. She said, okay, I'm going to get the ingredients out here. She said, now what I need you to do is go out to the front yard where the dog goes poop. I need you to just get me, just get me a turd out there, okay? And bring that into me. He's like, okay. Goes out and gets a little poo from the front yard and brings it into her and she sits it down and sits it down in front of her and she goes, okay. She has all the mix and she's mixing the brownies. She goes, and she, she cuts just the veriest fraction of a part of that poo off. Throws it in the brownie mix. <laughs> Mixes it up. And the boy's sitting there going, what are you doing, mom? What is going on here? And she goes, what, is, what are you talking about? I'm making some brownies before you go in the movie. She goes, he goes, Mom, you just put poop in the brownies. She goes, but only a little bit. It won't hurt you. Just a little. How oftentimes we think just a little won't hurt us, but the little contaminates us all. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Ezekiel, Ezekiel says this. Some of you may be here today, and when it comes to purity, when it comes to uh, your actions and your behavior and how you've lived life, some of you are sitting here today, I know, I know, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I'm so far from that. I've made bad decisions. I've behaved badly. I've said bad things. I've talked badly. I've, I just, I haven't, I've just been bad. I've been, you know, not good at all. I'm here to tell you, no matter where you're at, no matter what kind of your history or your past is, he's a God of second, third, and fourth chances. He's a God who forgives. He's a God who loves. He's a God who will, who will see where you're at. He'll love you right where you're at. But here's the thing. He will not leave you where you're at. He will take you to greater things. Today, you may be here and your marriage is not the best and you may be here today and you're your, your, maybe your life itself is not the best. Your friendships are not the best. Maybe you're here today and your personal life is really, really, really messed up. It's not pure at all. You don't feel purity at all. Well, here's what Ezekiel says. You know what I said about the heart? The heart is wicked. The heart is deceitful. The heart, there's no cure. Here's what Ezekiel said. Ezekiel said this, I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit in you. I will remove your heart of what? Your heart of stone. And I will give you a heart of flesh. You're here today. God wants you to know he's going to give you another chance. His love never fails. We're not just going to be Christian. We're going to be Christ-centered. We're not just going to parent to actions. We're going to parent to the heart. We're going to search our own hearts, and then we're going to pursue perfect purity. Bow your heads with me today. Father, this is a hard message for me to preach because it's one that does touch each one of our lives in some way, shape, or form. Every single one of us here today, God, struggle with purity. God, I know that there may be here, those here today that, that, that just think, well, that's just old-fashioned thinking. God, it's not old-fashioned. It's biblical thinking. And God, how I pray that you would open up hearts right now, that you would open up lives right now, and that people that are hurting here today, people who are struggling in their families, people who are struggling in their personal life, people who are struggling in their in their, uh, in their jobs or, God, in their, in their mental capacity, whatever they're struggling with, God, that they would come right now and they would surrender to you, God, because you have exactly what they need. With head bowed and eyes closed here today, right now in the presence of God, some of you really need God to help you. You've fallen for the lie. A little bit won't hurt. You need God to help you, give you strength, give you hope. You're hurting. Something deep within you is struggling. I just want to encourage you today. 
God loves you right where you're at. And if you'll surrender your life to him today, if you'll surrender who you are to him today, he'll give you another chance. He will, he will build you up and he'll, he'll, give your, he'll give you a new vision, a new sight that you've never known. Some of you here today, you say, well, I, I've been, I've been, I haven't ever been, been close to God or I've been so far from God. And it doesn't matter where you're at. What matters is God loves you right where you're at. God cares about you right where you're at. And all he's going to ask you to do is surrender your life to him. Trust him. Call out to him and say, I know my life is a, is a wreck and in chaos because I don't have God in it. And I need God to be center of everything that I am. I need Christ to help me through. With your head bowed and eyes closed today. You're here this morning. You say, I'm, I, I, I know I need God's help. I know that I'm at the bottom. I don't know where else to go. I just need him to help me. I need him to guide me, direct me, encourage me, and strengthen me. I need his spirit in me. With your head bowed and eyes closed. Would you just say this prayer with me right now between you and God? You're going to talk to God right now, very simply. Say these words. Say, God, here I am. You see all that I am. You see my past. You know what I've come through. You know what I've struggled with. And God, I ask you, forgive me. Change me. Help me to walk with you every day. I need you, God. Say this. I need you to be my source, to be my hope, to be my strength. So I give all I am to you right now. Now, God, as we journey through these forgotten virtues, the virtue of honor, God, teach us how to honor the people in our lives. Teach us how to lift them up, how to speak life into them, God, every day of our lives. And God, today, purity, help us to learn how to walk according to your pure ways, God. We struggle every day. Every day we're tempted. Every day we're struggling. But God, we're going to keep our eyes upon you and believe you, God for healing. May you guide and direct our steps, I pray in Jesus' name.